31 is is not a minute too soon uh maybe a minute too late so i want to welcome uh everybody to lucky task force meeting number 13 um i want to congratulate all of you for being uh so lucky as to start your day uh with the mayor and sdot and to end your afternoon with with the mayor and sdot um and for making it to this really big milestone i'm going to hand it over to uh former mayor nichols task force co-chair who's going to give us a little overview of of the agenda today uh who's then going to hand it over to paulina to to introduce our our, our special guest uh, of the day really um, and again this afternoon. So Mayor Nichols, over to you. An important decision uh, and announced it earlier this morning, both to task force members who were able to make a, a crack of dawn meeting and then to a press uh, conference just uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, so we're gonna be able to have a conversation uh, about that. Uh, and uh, then we're gonna, gingerly walk into the question of next steps. Uh, what role does the mayor uh, have in mind for the task force going forward? And uh, what do task force members think about uh, continuing to, uh, to provide advice and, and, uh, and guidance on the, on the project? So um, we want folks to engage. We're gonna have a, a Q and A uh, session but just before the Q&A, we're gonna give a few minutes for people to just share your thoughts. Uh, particularly, let me encourage those of you who are less verbal to uh, come forward during that uh, time period. That'll be about 10 minutes and then we'll have a half an hour Q&A uh, with the mayor uh, and with uh, Sam uh, from SDOT to uh, uh, clarify any questions that you might have regarding the decision and, and, and how we move forward. So with that, uh, let me just remind you, you'll, we've got that hand raising thing in the uh, chat function. Uh, that will make it much easier for us to be able to uh, get everybody uh, who uh, has an interest in speaking uh, an opportunity to do so um, and to do it in roughly the order that, that you've uh, uh, indicated you wanna speak. Uh, okay. And also identify yourself, the mayor will be here. So please identify yourself so she knows who, who and where on the screen uh, you are. With that, Paulina, any uh, comments? And then please introduce our special guest. Thank you so much, um, Mayor Durkin. Welcome to our community task force members again, task force meeting again. I truly appreciate um, seeing you twice today. Uh, maybe three times today. Um, I know it's a very um, tiring day, so completely um, agree with Greg. Uh, we truly appreciate your commitment to this um, community task force. Um, I think we had majority of our uh, task force members attending this morning at 8 a.m., so I'm very thankful for the commitment as for our task force members as well. Um, uh, it's an honor to have you here. Um, I know that you have been talking about this topic all day, but uh, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share some more time with you and uh, hear from our uh, Task Force members fellows as well. So welcome, Mayor Durkin, and um, thank you for being here. Thank you, Paulina. And again, my great thanks to you and Mayor Nichols for uh, chairing this endeavor. <clears throat> and to every task force member, to those who could make it at 8 a.m. this morning, thank you. Um, I, Deb, I, you need some more coffee, Deb. Come on, you're slouching down a little bit. <laughs> there we go. Um, and to those who couldn't, I'll just run through again if you haven't had an opportunity to hear. But I just want to start with truly a, a debt of gratitude from, from me, not just as mayor of Seattle, but as a resident and a person who was born and raised in this area. This was really a very important decision and a critical decision, not just for Seattle and West Seattle, um, but for our region uh, and for the Port of Seattle, for those communities that have been so impacted by this and particularly those communities of color that have been you know, under-resourced and impacted for generations really. So <clears throat> I wanna thank you for all the input that you've been able to give me to SDOT for all the time you've spent on this 
I know many people, when we called and asked you to serve, you didn't quite realize maybe how many meetings there would be and how much we would ask you to do. Um, but it mattered a lot. Uh, and your input mattered a lot. I read through every memo that was provided by each of the members before I made my decision, carefully weighed some of those, came back to others, because every time I reached a critical juncture here in, in working with SDOT, the outside experts, I'd learn something new and it would give me a little bit different perspective. So each, all of that made a big difference to me. <clears throat> you know, when the bridge closed on March 23rd, um, we were in the midst of several crises. We were one of the first into the global pandemic. Unfortunately, we're seeing an upturn again, but that caused us as a region to have to change almost everything we do in terms of how we live, how we perform our businesses, how we go about our lives, how we relate with family, if we've got kids, what that meant for them in school. Um, and in the midst of that very early days of the COVID crisis, our SDOT engineers and expect, inspecting the bridge discovered the cracking and made the recommendation that we should close it. And I will never forget getting the call from Sam um, and thinking what else could 2020 bring us? Um, but I will tell you that I tremendously respect him and the engineers doing the inspections, carefully looking at it, and then making the very difficult and courageous recommendation to me as mayor to say, this is hard, but we need to close it and we need to close it right away. Um, we did it very cognizant of the impacts it would have, particularly for the businesses and residents of West Seattle, Delridge, South Park, Georgetown, and others, <clears throat> as well as to the Port of Seattle, which truly is um, really one of the economic advantages Seattle and our region has. So all of you have heard that my decision is to move forward with repairs and not to do the mid-span replacement. I did it looking at a variety of factors. Um, number one, of course, was safety. Uh, from the very beginning, we have emphasized, and Sam has been clear, that we can only consider paths forward that really would be safe for the traveling public and that the engineers and technical advisory board told us were economically feasible and safe for a long enough period of time to make an investment worthwhile. Speed of recovery of mobility was critical to us never at the sacrifice of safety, but making sure that we could um, get this uh, route restored as quickly as possible. Uh, but with that, we needed to have a certain level of certainty, both that it could be restored, that the risk could be mitigated, and that we could do it in a reasonable time frame and have it do it for an amount of money and financing that we could reasonably obtain. Impact on communities weighed heavily on me throughout this process. Um, and in talking to businesses and residents of West Seattle and South Park and Delridge, um, I know that even in the time of COVID, this just has had very fundamental impacts on everyone's lives. And so that weighed heavily on us, particularly on centering those communities um, that have for, for very many generations suffered um, disproportionate impacts for the environmental burdens and the other burdens um, and the impacts on our communities of color. Jobs and economic recovery. We gotta fight for every job coming out of COVID. Every city in America and across the globe is going to be coming out of COVID at the same time and fighting to get some economy restored. And when we come back, we need to come back strong and more equitable and more just. And those jobs at the port were very important to me. Um, T5 is gonna be a, a, a significant asset for not just Seattle, but our region with good family wage jobs at that port that provide us um, some stability going forward. <clears throat> uh, obviously your input, input of the community and the experts were incredibly important. And at the end of the day, it came down to the two options because the others were eliminated for different reasons. And looking at the very um, aggressive schedule, which I asked Sam and his team to bring to do the mid-span replacement. Uh, I think that we determined the three years was very ambitious and there were too many things that if they shifted, would shifted that timeline out. Chief among them was obtaining the financing because it was it is a much more expensive proposition. 
um, and we will need federal financing. Um, based on conversations I had, it became clear that the time frame in which we needed to get that financing to meet our schedule was probably not realistic because Congress probably will not act until sometime mid or to the end of next year. The permitting and, and environmental review also um, was, was aggressive and optimistic and looking at some of the other programs we've done here in the city of Seattle, also there was some strong likelihood that that could slip. So taken together, it seemed that um, two years for repair um, at a lower price tag with the kind of certainty that the outside engineers and experts could give us seemed the most prudent route. But we also have to plan for the future. So I've also uh, uh, accepted and directed SDOT to do the study we need to do for replacement of the bridge. Just in case repair doesn't work, we think that it should based on the experts. And we today they emphasize it was their unanimous opinion that it would. But we know we're going to have to replace this bridge. And let's do it in a, in a thoughtful manner, but let's get prepared now. And then also I want to have some ongoing consultations and discussions with Sound Transit because we know we're building a new bridge. And if we've learned anything from this is that we need redundancy and we need to have mobility for the future. And that includes more transit, more ways to get people out of their cars. So I think it's time to start that conversation with Sound Transit to see whether the bridge we know we're going to build in the next decade will be a bridge that serves more purposes. So again, those were the reasons we've got lots of work to do. I wanna call on you to continue your involvement, um, advice and the like, because the more transparency we give every step moving forward, the more public confidence there will be that we're doing this right. So thank you very much again. And I think with that, I turn it over briefly to Sam. Is that what happens next? Sam Zimbabwe, take it away. Right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to go through a couple of slides because I, I know we've we've talked about a lot of things. I don't think we've we've um, shown you some of the pictures uh, recently, but you know, just to reiterate some of what uh, Mayor Durkin just just outlined, um, you know, this is the fastest way to restore the mobility that we've lost, and we expect this to to last for years to come. Um, the mayor outlined some of the the key concerns that. Uh, with with rapid replacement um, and and sort of where we're going, so we can go forward. Um, I'll just give you know I, I know I think we've already, probably already heard some questions uh, emerging, and just want to make sure that we we give everybody uh, these details before we get into the the full questions and answers. Um, so uh, what we've done to date, and these are pictures from inside of the um, inside of the bridge and underneath the bridge from the work platform. Um, what we have done so far uh, seems to be performing well. It, it performs in line with the, the structural models that we've done, uh, and we'll continue to understand more as it gets a little bit colder um, and as, as we get to the, the full range of the thermal cycle. Uh, the picture on the top here is showing the new, newly installed post-tensioning cables within the bridge. So this is the the bridge structure itself is hollow. The ceiling of this area is the bridge deck, and the floor is what you see from uh, from below from the river. Um, and these are new uh, steel cables mounted inside the bridge. Each of those black tubes is is holding those. Um, the the steel cables are encased in in those. Uh, each of those is now holding two hundred and eighty thousand pounds of uh, of force, um, and this same structure uh, is repeated again on the, the um, other box girder. Um, so that this is what has been installed as part of the stabilization work. Um, the picture on the bottom shows the work from the, the work platform. And you can see some of the older epoxy um, uh, injected into cracks. And we've, um, we've also installed uh, carbon fiber polymer wrap. Um, so uh, um, I think the next slide actually has a picture of a couple more pictures. Uh, I can describe a little bit more what has been done and what will continue to be done. Um, this, uh, uh, the bottom right picture here shows the saw uh, uh, helping to release the stuck bearing on Pier 18. Um, that's been another key component of this early stabilization work. The, larger image shows 
where those steel cables are uh, located within the bridge. And so this is the span that crosses over the river. Um, it shows uh, we were sort of right near the anchor bolts in that previous image. Um, uh, and it stretches across the span about a little bit over 300 feet um, to hold the whole bridge together. Um, if you go back one, for one quick second, I'll talk just a little bit more about what is to come. Um, the upcoming work includes additional post-tensioning work both within the center span and in the other, other bridge spans, the two on the one on either side, um, and then some work to determine how as the bridge ages, um, where we might need work and uh, what our sort of overall projected lifespan will be both of these repairs and for the, the bridge as a whole um, so that we can work um, towards a, a orderly replacement at some point in the future. Um, I just wanna reiterate again, uh, this is um, a challenging engineering solution. It's not unprecedented. It's not, um, uh, it's, 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 I think Barbara earlier today in the press conference said it's, it's not complicated, but it remains, it remains challenging work that we have to design carefully and, um, and diligently and don't, it can't skip steps uh, in the, in the effort to uh, accelerate. So we have to do this work carefully. We have to do it diligently, um, but we have every, uh, every likelihood of success if we can do that. Um, we can jump forward two slides, I think. I talked through all of this. Uh, just to, to, to talk about the, the schedule here, because uh, I know that's a place where we're, I'm sure there are questions. Our phase one stabilization work is nearly complete, and that started uh, immediately after closing the bridge to traffic. Um, we designed, permitted, and built that work uh, between April and we'll, we'll wrap up that phase of work in December. We've already begun the design process on phase two, but there is still uh, we, the, a lot of the details will be worked out as we see how the bridge responds in, in detailed ways to the stabilization work uh, and the completion thereof. Um, we expect that that construction um, won't start in earnest until next fall, um, but then have that uh, um, through through early 2022 and open to traffic in mid 2022. Um, these are timelines that uh, reflect where we think we'll be. We'll do everything that we can to accelerate those timelines. Um, but these are these are realistic given the work that still is uh, needs to be done and, and uh, has to be completed from both a design and a construction perspective. Go forward one more. And I I think, uh, so there's, I think there's just a couple more and then we'll really open it up to questions. Um, uh, one of the ways that we're looking at accelerating this work uh, as, as much as possible is to potentially use an alternative delivery method uh, that's known as general contractor construction manager uh, or GCCM. Um, and that help, will help us engage, sort of not get to the full end of the design process um, and bid out a set of construction plans, but be able to bring a contractor on board uh, potentially earlier in the, a little bit earlier in the process um, and be a partner in the, in the late stages of design and constructability. Um, that can often help us identify costs or schedule savings um, and, and uh, enable the contractor to bring on subcontractors um, to, uh, to, to d deliver the work in ways that uh, sequence the work appropriately. Um, so as we get that work going forward too, we'll also be able to hone in on some of the other important equity considerations as part of our uh, continued investment in the bridge, including um, uh, minority and women-owned business utilization, uh, apprentice, uh, you know, apprenticeship programs, workforce development programs that go along with a major investment like this. Go forward again. Um, a brief, another uh, point or two about the costs. Um, you know, we've talked about the uh, the numbers that were in the cost benefit analysis of about an additional forty seven million dollars uh, needed for this this stage of repair. Um, that is still at a at a early cost estimate stage. Um, we've invested a, about twenty million dollars in the stabilization efforts. Uh, we'll have a, a bit more. 
uh, firm cost estimate in early 2021 as we advanced the design. Um, but this is th that was the number that we carried through the cost benefit analysis, trying to take into account a lot of contingencies and, and understanding where things might be. Um, the program as a whole uh, also includes um, an estimate of around $50 million for traffic mitigation uh, and $10 million for low bridge repair. Uh, just a brief note on the traffic mitigation, that number includes both uh, traffic uh, bike, biking and walking investments that we have made and will continue to make. It also includes um, expectations around additional transit uh, investments, transit operation investments that, that uh, would be needed. Now that we have, um, you know, as we refine the timeline and understand sort of where we where we stand in terms of the mitigations that have already happened and what we still need to do, we'll be able to refine that $50 million number as well. Uh, funding, we'll still be looking for partnerships at all levels um, uh, and um, understanding um, that we also know that there will be significant funding necessary in the future when we ultimately have to replace the bridge. And we need to start thinking now about um, how, how we might secure both the ongoing maintenance and operations costs associated with the bridge and what that eventual replacement funding will be now, what will be in the future. And I think there's one more. So just we, uh, Mayor Durkin said this, we're gonna continue this, the type size and location study uh, to plan for that future replacement that will give us preliminary design, uh, a better understanding of what will be necessary. Um, really, this also gives us an opportunity to look at the full range of transportation needs into and, and out of West Seattle and, and how, we, uh, how we plan for as much redundancy as possible. Um, and our ability to, I think that a lot of the mitigations um, that we have put in place and, and will continue to put in place as part of the Reconnect West Seattle program are good investments for the long term of the of the Duwamish Valley and the, and the communities um, uh, that are impacted right now. Uh, those will continue as well. And uh, our need for continued investment in, in the low bridge uh, to ma maintain critical mobility as we um, execute these additional repairs. So with that, um, that's just a brief overview of sort of where, where, what we're still doing and, and what uh, is going on. And uh, I think now we'll open it up to questions. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Durkin. Thank you, Sam, uh, for that great update. So we will like to take a moment, about 10 minutes, to hear from uh, community task force members um, feedback or questions that you may have. This is a great opportunity to bring those. Hey, Marcy, do you want to go ahead? I see your hand is up. Sure. Can you hear me? We can. <clears throat> okay. And Marcy, Hi, can Mayor you int Durkin. introduce yourself, please? Sure. I'm Marcy Carpenter. Um, <clears throat> I was appointed to this task force, I think, for my background in transit advocacy and disability advocacy. I also live in the Admiral neighborhood. <clears throat> um, Mayor Durkin, I have a couple of questions. Um, the projection is that the bridge could last up to four years, the rest of its projected life. And, but you're also talking about building a bridge that would be compatible with, with light rail, I think, which would happen much sooner. So kind of curious about that, if you are thinking about a bridge in that time frame, um, <clears throat> And then, Given that the last 50 years of federal transportation policy has been that it's nearly impossible to get funding to replace a bridge that isn't fallen down or in or closed in some way, um, <clears throat> what gives you the confidence to feel that you know we'll be able to get this money for to replace a bridge that's already repaired? Thank you. Thanks for those questions. I'm going to try to answer them uh, maybe in a little bit different order than you gave. And thanks again for your service on this. So in looking at the um, options, what became pretty clear to us in terms of the current two options, either repair or replacement, is that we will still try to get federal funding and state funding for the repair, but we won't need to get it to the same extent 
Um, if we did the replacement, we had no option. We have to get federal funding and the significant difference in the costs um, between the two projects um, was sufficient enough that an uncertainty about getting the federal funding that when you put the uncertainty around the federal funding together with the permitting um, and the other issues, it was clear, number one, we're not gonna demolish the bridge until we know we can build a new bridge if we had gone that route. And it looked like we would not know about federal funding until well until next year, maybe the end of the year, which pushed that time frame out again. And if the permitting were to follow other projects we had here, that would also be a period of time that we would uh, have to extend the life. So we were looking in, ex I think, reasonably well in excess of the three years. Looking at the corridor and measuring those things, we knew that restoring mobility was important. On sound transit, the, the reason is this, and part of this, I will, I, you know, I plagiarize the best stuff um, from anywhere I can. And this is really from one of your task force members, Peter Goldman who wrote really eloquently about the need to make sure that as we do a bridge, number one, first try to see if we can accommodate light rail. Unfortunately, neither of these options could do that. Neither the mid-span replacement nor the repair could accommodate uh, sound transit in the future because we don't know which pathway they're choosing. We don't know what elevation it's coming in and leaving the bridge on. Um, and so the engineering around that was, was not feasible or the timeline was feasible, but we do know we do know for certainty, we are building another bridge across the Duwamish, that Sound Transit is going to be building a bridge um, and the construction on that will be sometime later in the decade, seven to 10 years from now. We're in EIS right now, but it seems to me the time to have the conversation with Sound Transit that these are public dollars. Um, and we know from this experience now, which we didn't know before we started the EIS on Sound Transit, what happens when we lose the mobility to West Seattle? what happens for residents and businesses in the neighborhoods and communities, and what happens to the jobs at the port. And we are making, as a region, the, the two ports, Tacoma and Seattle, are making huge investments into the T5 terminal, which will produce thousands of great family wage jobs. But we won't get those if we don't have mobility in the corridor. So on balance, I felt that we had to make this path, but I have a lot of confidence in our congressional delegation's ability to get funding for projects here. Um, we've, we've done well historically, and I think that we will continue to do well. Are there a lot of people in line? Of course there are, um, but we've always been able to find, uh, I think our lion's share and looking to the future, the more innovative we are about those projects, the more likely we will to be able to get that funding. Thank you um, for that question. Thank you, Deb Barker. Hi there, um, Mayor Durkin, thank you for, thank you for making a decision. I just wanna share with you that uh, this afternoon, the neighbors have all been talking about it. Like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And yeah, neighbors will all uh, second guess everything. Um, I have two questions right now. Um, one is where are the maintenance and ops uh, Where's the maintenance and ops money coming from? That's, uh, I'd really like to know that uh, up front. Also, what sort of permits are anticipated? Are we looking at state and city and federal? Uh, what do we have on the table? So those are two questions. And lastly, I served on the stakeholder advisory group um, for Sound Transit 3 uh, as a West Seattle representative, and I advocated, <laughs> I was reminded of this this morning, I advocated strongly for when Sound Transit built their uh, new bridge, that until their trains were uh, in operation, that Metro be permitted to use uh, that new bridge over the Duwamish River. And I, I got... Uh, I got zero traction from Sound Transit. So I wish everybody well <laughs> on uh, trying to have uh, this happen. But again, my question is permits and maintenance money. Thanks. Well, I'm, gonna talk, I'm gonna talk just briefly on them then I'm gonna let Sam's done a lot of thought on this. So I'm gonna give them to you. One is on Sound Transit, I still think we can start the conversation. Um, we need a future where people are not in their cars. And we won't have that future if they don't have alternative routes to get in and that are safe and accessible and frequent and convenient. 
Um, and so we have to be building that capacity for the future. Yep. Um, in terms of money, I'm gonna let Sam talk about the details, but you know, I think that we have to look globally at our needs for infrastructure and transit and the like. You'll see a lot of discussion in the press about should the $20 VLF be used for infrastructure or should it be used for transit? I think we have to look holistically at what the VLF money will do, what the reserves we got from 976, um, what we're doing from the transportation benefit district sales tax that everyone just passed and think strategically, not just short-term, but long-term about how we make sure that we maximize our transit capabilities, our mobility and do the infrastructure that we need. Um, and I think we can do those things. I think there's also, we've talked about, it's too early to say we can do it, but there might be ways to capitalize some of the ongoing maintenance so that you have a, a dedicated fund. It's a little bit tricky, but I think there are things we can do to do that. Sam, I'll let you carry on from that. Sure. Um, you know, just really briefly on the on the permits, there's always permission from someone to do to do anything. Uh, re certainly repairing the bridge is a little bit simpler. Uh, we don't have some of the, you know, needing to permit a, a new new structure and a new uh, bridge across across the uh, navigation channel. Um, but we do need permits uh, from you know, we'll, we'll know more as we as we have the final design and exactly the construction methods, but um, railroad, uh, state, federal, there, there can be a, a range of permits that does on a repair that is not um, expected to to hold us up in the um, in the in the process that we're going going through. Um, I think just to echo uh, Mayor Durkin's comments on, on maintenance funding, we recognize we have a lot of assets. Um, Bridges, retaining walls, roads, sidewalks, uh, and a and a large uh, set of needs of of investment. Um, when we talk about some of the the ongoing costs of the repaired structure, um, some of that is in the inspection, the additional inspections that will be needed. Um, some of it is in the the monitoring equipment that we'll have there, just to make sure that we um, keep track of the structure and and. Uh, catch any challenges early, as early as possible. Uh, and then some of it is that we, those, those images that I showed you of the um, new external post tensioning are all new systems that we will just have to make sure are working well and, and uh, potentially uh, invest in over time as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's hard to project what some of those costs are. Um, the other thing that I'll say, and this maybe goes back just slightly to Marcy's comments before is that, um, you know, part of the, repair work that we do, the design work that, we, that we're doing will also be a little bit uh, more broad examination of the, the bridge and the full components and, and understanding sort of where we have um, uh, potential issues that might emerge in, in, the, in the future and sort of what, what the um, future life of the bridge might look like um, and how and where we might need to continue to invest in the bridge, which will also give us some better sense of when uh, and how it needs to be replaced. So um, all of that sort of fits into this larger funding conversation that we'll have to have uh, as a city about our, all of our maintenance needs. Thank you. Diane Salsny. Thank you, Paulina. Um, good afternoon, Aaron, everybody. So um, I, I have a couple of different um, points um, that I've been thinking about. Um, so on the, so let me just say what they are and then, you know, it, it's different. I don't know, some may go to you, May, or some may go to Sam. Um, the uh, for uh, and, and they're not necessarily sequential, but um, on the issue of the money, when you showed that slide, Sam, um, I was under an impression, um, and I think Lisa, Lisa Herbal, I think you told me this at one point, that there was a hundred million dollars um, for the repair. I might, I might have that wrong, but that's that's sticking in my mind. But I was, un if it's, if the number's wrong, but what I thought I understood. Um, and, and Lisa obviously should comment, but um, 
is that there was the money for the repair. So when I, I, was, I was having trouble following your slide, Sam, about is, what is the cost of the repair? What is that number? Are we confident about it? And do we have the money? Because one of the things we've talked a lot about on uh, this committee and then in um, subgroups is um, when the report came out not that long ago about all the bridges in the area that need maintenance and you know what if another bridge failed, what does that do to this project if we're doing repair, not replace? What is the sequencing? Does it change? You know, I, I mean, I don't have the list of the bridges, but I, I think that's something maybe somebody has done that um, uh, thinking and looking at, but that's one question. The second is, and I get the, um, the commitment mayor that you made to have a decision um, by now and that the uncertainty for all of us is, is really um, difficult uh, financially and otherwise for the businesses and the port and so forth, um, particularly in light um, of COVID. But I'm wondering if the timing may be off, that maybe this decision of repair or replace didn't need to be made today. And the reason I say that is I don't know if things change if, for example, the Democrats win Georgia in the Senate runoff and there's a majority in the Senate because a number of us, SEIU and other places, have been talking about what we need is a major job and in infrastructure initiative coming from, um, we would hope, a Biden-Harris administration and something like the WPA um, or some, you know, 21st century equivalent of that. That uh, And one of the things that happened with the WPA, and I was uh, reading an article about this, is they obviously a lot less complicated, a lot less rules and regulations, but they suspended certain things. Now, you don't want to do that naively or for at the sake of safety, but it's like, we're, this is not, we're not in normal times. And so I just, I don't know if there's an opportunity to push this decision back, because I think there are still some things that aren't known. The, um, the, air, the issue of co-locating I mean, I obviously, with all the things we deal with, the idea is very appealing of having this open in 2022. And I don't know if we're talking first quarter of 22, middle, it would be good to get that answer. But um, again, as we know, if you've ever, I know it's not the same, remodeling a house and fixing a bridge is, I know it's not the same, but if you've ever done any kind of work, construction work like that, and everyone says, oh, it's gonna be ready here. And then you find, oh, we didn't anticipate this. We didn't anticipate that. And it gets pushed out. So, um, and if the bridge were to luckily be um, viable for more than 15 years, this question about co-locating sound transit or light rail with it um, just m makes me wonder about using good money now to build or repair something that would potentially have a lot of longevity, but say, well, we're not gonna wait 40 years to do a new bridge that could combine both of these functions. So I just, I just think there's some gaps here that um, I think are worth considering. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'm gonna let Sam step in, but let me address a couple of those because I think it's, um, the uh, there's obviously unknowns and there's unknowns in either one of the options and the schedule slip and discovering things that you weren't expecting would, would apply to both of them. 
which is one of the reasons why repairing just the mid span, if that schedule slips, we're looking at four and five years without mobility in this corridor, which I think would be the death knell for many of the businesses in West Seattle, as well as the port. Um, and when we come out of COVID, you know, we've been pretty lucky in some regards, our region and our city, because we have a very robust tech community, which has been able to work from home. And they're generating sales tax and BO tax that keeps our government and government services going. Our construction jobs have remained pretty healthy and our port jobs now are back. Um, we need to make sure that we keep those healthy. And I think that we have a really, and, and not just the threat that we sometimes hear we're leaving, but it's a little bit of a gamble for SSA to come in there and rejuvenate T5. And it's a huge infrastructure build. And I, I think that if we don't have mobility, they just can't physically get their freight from the terminal and they've got other options. So there was that issue. Um, on the unknowns, yeah, maybe we will get a, 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 a Senate and maybe there'll be a big infrastructure bill. And if there's, if there's someone, there's a chance we can get lots of money I don't think we can't, we would never say we're not going to revisit because everything we're doing right now is necessary for either option. We will not be done with the, 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 the bolstering of the bridge until first quarter of next year. And that is part of repairing. Um, I think it's a long shot talking to the chair of the transportation committee in the house. He does not believe, and he's assuming there's a Biden administration and hoping for a democratic Senate. He thinks it's going to go through regular markup. And by the time they get agreement on size and scope, you're through mid to end of next year for infrastructure. If we're, we are not, we can revisit it, but we're at a juncture now. I believe that we've got to start making a decision but we got to mitigate against the risk, which is why I'm having the Seattle Department of Transportation on Sam's recommendation, continue with the study for replacement. So that, you know, the biggest risk of, I think of repair is that the bridge doesn't perform how the experts tell us it's going to perform. Um, because I've got this hangover from 2020 when nothing quite went how it was supposed to go. Um, you rely on the experts, but then you, you know, have a backup plan. And so having that, um, we will have in place you know, they're starting that study. So I, I think that um, we do have money set aside already. I don't want to broadcast that I think we got all we need because I'm going to be asking the state legislature and the feds for some help um, because I, I am mindful that we've got a lot of needs for all of our revenues. Sam, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, I, I just want to say, um, I think, you know, when, when we're talking about uh, reopening in 2022 that is um uh, you know diane you, you said use the house analogy um so far we've we've hit the timelines that we have committed um uh, in terms of uh at how the stabilization work has gone when we're talking about mid 2022 that is using those same approaches that we've taken to publicly communicate timelines and then do our best to meet them or exceed them where possible. So um, I, I just want to say, you know, we don't we don't have all the answers, um, and uh, but it's really important for us to be pulling in in one direction at this point and and moving forward with as as Mayor Durkin said, um, making sure that we don't uh, lose opportunities or go too far down a line and and discover something that is is unexpected. But you know, we're 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 all pushing extremely hard. This is still. And we recognize this. This is a long emergency for the communities of West Seattle and the Duwamish Valley. This is this is an ongoing crisis that will be like this until the bridge is is reopened, uh, and we'll have to be doing everything we can as a department and as a city to to move forward. I'll also just say that we do have uh, the hundred million dollars um, sort of box drawn that's anticipated to be um, you know future uh, uh, bond issuance against future city revenues. Um, I think to that th those future revenues come from someplace else, some other project that we could be doing, some other need that we could be doing. And so when, when the mayor talks about uh, partnerships at all levels, we still think um, that there's a, there's a need and a, and a benefit to having um, uh, resources from, from all levels coming into this project to get the job done. These are all great questions and feedback. We're going to be taking, um, one more question. I think we see John Temple, but we have we want to have some time to to um, 
talk about the next steps as a committee, task force committee. So, Jen. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Jen Temple with uh, West Seattle Bridge. Now, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to Mayor Durkin uh, for uh, making this decision and for not putting it off any longer uh, to use uh, the word that Sam just used, which is emergency. We're now eight months into this emergency. And, um, you know, I am certainly grateful as our thousands of residents of West Seattle and our small businesses that we are moving forward. Um, and, uh, you know, this morning hearing from uh, Peter and others who are, who are greatly relieved, we, we express that relief as well. Um, not just for the businesses and the jobs, but, you know, those of us, some of us actually do leave West Seattle <laughs> and need to leave West Seattle. And, um, you know, whether it's for healthcare, uh, you know, emergency room visits, all kinds of different things. We don't have a hospital here. And, and that's a real issue uh, of concern, especially during a pandemic. Um, and, you know, I'm not willing, and I, a lot of us aren't willing to, to wait for, for a Senate that may or may not happen or anything else. And so we really appreciate your recognition about the uncertainty around the federal funding. Cause I think that first and foremost was probably the most critical you know, factor in this rapid replacement was getting the funding for it. And that just never seemed realistic from our perspective. So thank you so much and really, really appreciate uh, your, your thoughtful and decision-making on this. Okay, thank you, Jen. I appreciate the feedback. Um, Mayor Durkin, would you like to say some um, final statements or? Yeah, I think, look, there was a variety of opinions. Um, and, and even in those who thought it was a close call, I, uh, you've probably read all the memos too, but many people said, I started for one thing, I ended up in the other direction. Um, and that was some people started for replacement and then decided they wanted repair. Some people started repair, wanted replacement. And it shows you that it's a really one, that how thoughtful people are being. And they're looking at the same factors that I looked at. So I think there can be honest disagreement in weighing these risks. Um, but at the end of the day, making sure that we can return this mobility in a way, but still plan for the future. And I just want to clarify one thing, because there's been a lot of confusion around it. The current bridge itself or the mid-span replacement, neither of the options we were looking at can be used to, to work with light rail. It just doesn't work, um, both because of timelines and engineering. So once that option was off the table, that made a big difference to me in terms of how do we plan for the future? Because I, I think we all have an obligation to leave the city better for the next generation and to be thinking, what does that generation need and going to look like? We need a new bridge and we need it to be innovative. And I could see you know, some of the things about the rapid replacement, it may not be off the table for whatever the new span is because people are looking at these expedited bridge building. You still have to span a river. That's just you know geography. So I also think though, if we're going to be building a new bridge with certitude, and when I say we, I mean we, the taxpayers, the region, the people of Seattle, we should try to make it do more than one thing. Now that conversation may not go anywhere. I know Sound Transit is bounded by what the voters approved. Um, they're already in the environmental impact, but I think we're smart and innovative enough that we can say, okay, if this bridge is going to last for the next 50, 75 years, and we're not going to start on it for another seven years, let's, let's see if we can imagine a better bridge that gives us more mobility, that gets people out of their cars, that maybe gives us more, not just light rail, but light rail and transit. Um, so that's where I think that some of the, we can now put our energies on what does that next phase look like? Um, and, and hoping that our engineers are right, that this bridge will last the 15 to 40 years. Thank you. And before you leave, I, I would like to hear also, what is your visioning for, the, for our um, community task force moving forward as we still have a journey to go? We do. Well, I think one would be for you all to discuss how much I know we've already um, we've really put a lot of burden on folks. This was an intensive work and intensive time committee. But I think one thing that you provided was not only input to SDOT and myself, but you provided a level of accountability that is really important on these projects. 
Um, and now you are schooled in all the details. And I think some ongoing basis where we can report back in on where we are and what the next phases are. If we start a conversation with Sound Transit, we're gonna need a lot of community support and input on that. Um, so I think, you know, looking at the contours of that, the more people are willing to be involved and we can set a regular schedule and kind of what does that scope of work look like? But you've developed now one, working together, two, some subject matter expertise, and obviously you care because you spent this much time. But I also don't wanna presume that people can continue. I, I mean, I know I'm looking around all these squares and I know what your daily lives are like. Um, but having some level of interest and accountability and input on an ongoing basis, I think is going to be really important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Durkin. And I agree, you know, it's, it's, we always go through the concepts of if it's about me, it, it cannot be without me. So I truly appreciate your visioning for um, community uh, engagement into this process. And um, for, there, there is not quite honestly, um, a lot of opportunities that decisions are being made on environmental justice and on climate visioning, which is something that you have highlighted and I have truly appreciate hearing from you thinking on the future and in the current situations of communities. Um, okay, so I'm gonna pass it on to um, my co-chair, Greg Nichols here. Um, as we are about to eight minutes, uh, we have some short time to discuss next steps into our next meeting on December 2nd. We want to have an opportunity to be here with you, hear these important feedback uh, reactions that you had, and also to make sure that you know, Mayor Durkin, that we appreciate the time that you have given us um, today and to hear directly from us. Thank you. Thank you very here. much. I've got to run to another Zoom meeting, but I will be back in touch and make myself available too. And I just want to say again, and I truly mean it, thank you. Um, the amount of caring and effort you put in this. And I also, I've been doing it in every meeting, but I've got to thank Sam and Heather and Matt and Elliot and Shafali, the, the team that kept making this happen and all of the folks at SDOT who have moved through, you know, COVID, the economic crisis, they kept working, they kept showing up, they were innovative. Um, I had the opportunity with your two co-chairs to, to look at the bridge, to climb down the wobbly ladder that's hundreds of feet above the ground or the, the channel and, and look at the inside and see those steel cables. Um, and Sam's exactly right. It may not be the most complicated thing, but it is challenging and it's innovative. Um, and they've done it at, at some record speeds, but it's also happening because they feel accountable to you. So I wanna thank them and I hope you all extend your thanks to them too, because I think they are shown us the best of government. So with that, I'll leave you be and, and good luck to everyone. One last thing, I have to say it, COVID's getting bad again. Um, in the city of Seattle, 20% of the cases that we have had since the beginning of COVID have happened in the last two weeks. Our hospitals are filling up. Our frontline healthcare providers are exhausted. They have been working around the clock and they are juggling the same things that every single one of us is juggling. Some of them are commuting long distance. They have their kids at home. They're trying to homeschool. They're, they've got sick family members. Um, and on top of that, they keep showing. And it is hard because the holidays are when we usually gather with people that we don't see for a long time. And then we don't wanna see them again for another year sometimes, but, but it's that time. I cooked for 25 people last year. And this year it's just my small immediate family. We have to stay home. We shouldn't gather. If you, you know, wear your mask, wash your hands, stay safe. Because as I said in an earlier call with some folks today, if you gather with people outside your home um, at Thanksgiving, you may be visiting them in the hospital by Christmas. Um, this, we are just seeing such a surge in this virus and is probably the most perilous time that our city has faced on a healthcare crisis. And each one of us can kind of control it. So be safe, take care, have a good Thanksgiving. And thank you so much for caring so much about and giving all this time. So take care, everybody. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor, indeed. Well, just uh, wrapping up today, uh, some of you have been on this uh, off and on since eight o'clock this morning, many of you. Um, and so 
thank you for your forbearance today. I think that a lot of the work that we have done uh, over the last five months um, uh, led, helped lead to this moment and provided uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, at least asked the questions that the mayor no doubt wrestled with as she made this decision. So uh, once again, thank you for your engagement uh, in this process. So you get next week off um, as a reward for that. We're gonna come back together on December 2nd uh, we're going to uh, take a look at Reconnect West Seattle and what progress has been made and what we're looking forward to in the, in the near future. We're going to talk once again about the low bridge and uh, are there any tweaks, are there any opportunities uh, to uh, reassess that. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what is our role going forward. We're here at the mayor's request to advise her that there's going to be two long years for people uh, in, in, in these affected communities. Uh, and there's a lot of work to do everything we can to mitigate that pain uh, for them. So uh, we'll have that conversation, but enjoy your Thanksgiving. Uh, you've earned it and, uh, and stay safe. Thank you all very much. Greg, I just wanted to add, that was great. Um, this will be a good timing also to be hearing from the rest of our community. So please, um, bring those thoughts, bring that feedback. So when we um, come back together, uh, we can incorporate them in the discussions that we have. Um, they know that you all represent. I'm, I'm pretty sure you will also be rich to do some uh, media interviews. Let us know if you need any support or any help. Um, we are here for you and we look forward to seeing you on the second. Thank you, everybody. Any thanks. No, no. Okay, Thank you. sorry. That I heard. All right. Thank, Thank you, you co-chairs. You're doing great. Cheers, all. <laughs> now we can yes. go rest. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>